The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Does God Exist? A Debate Between Matt Delahunty and Blake Junta. This debate was recorded on July 12, 2015 and was sponsored by the Bible and Beer Consortium in Fort Worth, Texas. Due to the length of this debate, this video covers everything prior to the audience Q&A, which will be posted in a second video. There were also some minor audio issues that I'll be investigating for future recordings. Please enjoy. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, The Live Oak, uh, Bill Smith, Lee Brooks, Asher and the staff here who take such wonderful care of us. Uh, 1248 Ministries, Gordon Rhodes, beliefmap.org, and Tobacco Lane, Fort Worth, who gave us uh, a substantial donation of tobacco and cigars. I'll remind you, we do not smoke in this room. I am refraining. Um, we will all go to the roof afterwards. If this is your first time at a BBC event, raise your hand. See what kind of drama you are already? <laughs> you are remarkably brave individuals. I don't know if I'd go to anything had Bible and beer in the title and not what it was. Um, historically, we present a topic from a biblical perspective. I just realized in an environment that with good beer is sold, for me to see emphasis on the adjective notes, good. So and then we do a, a QA. and um, You are joining us tonight during our debate series. We have a topic presented from two contrasting perspectives. Um, I think you should find a way to move. I want to encourage you if you're here, obviously so these chairs are very valuable. Did you see my debate? So if you're a patron, we encourage you to tip the staff until they say stop it, that's too much. <laughs> staff, are you still accepting tips? Yes. Yes, yes okay. <laughs> Just checking. Um, my name is Ezra Boggs. I founded this two years ago as an idea just uh, to have some friends get together and have these discussions and it has grown substantially so thank you all very very much thank you to our live stream audience watching online if you're watching online uh, we are submitting questions to questions at the bible and consortium.com that will be used during q a yes i don't see the website enough so BibleAndBeerConsortium.com. If you type in Google, go to Bible and, we're coupled with like Bible and strange things. So beer is a small one. We're easy to find. Forthcoming events, BBC Debate Series, August 9th. Back here at the Live Oak, we have Dr. John Ferrer debating Dave Smalley, dog and debate. Topic will be, how can God be good when there's so much evil? September 25th, which is a Friday, we're back in Dallas at the door. The topic is, is abortion murder? We have a former abortionist provi abortion provider from Austin, and uh, we are getting both candidates for that now. I'm gonna go ahead and ask um, these the events videos. are all live streamed, thanks to the brilliance of Michael Whitehead. Oh, I'm right now. Here, grab my, I'm gonna grab that paper. And Peter Shea in the back. Just move Thank you, Peter. Right there and I'll be fine. Okay. If you do not want to be videotaped, leave now. <laughs> You've been warned. Tonight's speakers. Blake Junta is the founder of beliefmap.org, an interactive online encyclopedia which aims to provide users with academically respected points and counterpoints an in the debate over God's existence, well, we as well as a debate over yet. Jesus' resurrection. He has 10 years of experience researching and writing on these subjects, I as well as regular so interaction with a variety of non-believers. He is co-director of the Reasonable Faith Group at the University of Texas at Dallas and has appeared on a number of atheist talk radio shows and podcasts, including Dogma Debate, Atheistically Speaking, where he enjoys having cordial discussions on these important issues. Tonight, speaking to the topic, Does God Exist? Please welcome Blake Junta. Well, good evening. I want to begin by thanking the Bible and Beer Consortium for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. Uh, it's really a special privilege to be having this discussion with you all, and especially with uh, Matt Dillahunty. I know a lot of you have grown up uh, listening to Matt, and if you're like me, uh, you probably, <laughs> you probably, 
that wasn't meant to be like that. Oh, if you're like me, uh, uh, you've grown to appreciate, uh, in particular, uh, sort of Matt's uh, carefulness that he brings to sort of these conversations. He, he's very skeptical, but at the same time, uh, it's a careful kind of skepticism that I appreciate and um, that I think can be emulated. That said, I want to make a, a careful um, presentation, uh, a careful case for God's existence. And, and in order to establish that God probably exists. Now that word probably there is denoting a measure of confidence. Uh, and this is a very what we call Bayesian way of talking. Uh, and correspondingly, this is a form of Bayes' theorem. And what it says is that your confidence, what you say is probable, should depend on two issues, which I'm going to focus on tonight. In the case of theism, one, what is the intrinsic probability of the hypothesis that God exists prior to looking at any evidence? And two, look at the evidence. How well does it fare in comparison to its competitor? On that uh, first question, uh, theorists have largely associated the intrinsic probability of an hypothesis uh, with its simplicity and modesty. And I want to suggest that the God hypothesis uh, is very modest because one can use pure reason to confirm so much of it before seeing any evidence at all. So for example, I understand God to be very simply the greatest possible being. Uh, theists often say this implies that if God exists, God is necessary. He, he is so great that God could not be gone from reality. If I can show you by reason alone that an entity exists in this way, um, or, then it seems like theism would get an intrinsic boost, or an, a boost in its intrinsic probability. And that's because it's one less way that the hypothesis uh, could go wrong. And I think I can show you that. First, you have to know that modal logic is a standardized logic. It's taught in every major university, and it's used in many disciplines, including computer science. Second, you just have to know that it's a famously proven theorem in standard modal logic that if something is possibly necessary, then it's actually necessary. So if a necessary entity is possible in this logical metaphysical sense, then per this theorem, it actually exists. In fact, it has to exist. And if that sounds weird at first, uh, you're not alone. This is, uh, and this might help, uh, necess excuse me, so uh, consider like a mathematical truth. Um, I apologize, I have to see if I can scroll this down. Yeah, so consider a mathematical truth like uh, 6 cubed equals 216. If that's possibly necessary, then we would say it, it's actually necessary. And if it's possibly false, then it's necessarily false. Um, that may or may not help you, but just know that the big debate today is over whether a necessary being is genuinely possible. And one argument of many, published recently in support of this possibility, comes from philosopher Josh Rasmussen. And it inspired a much simpler argument, uh, published by John Turi a year later. So here it is. Premise one, it is possible that the first contingent thing is caused to exist. Contingent things are non-necessary things. So ask yourself if this scenario I'm about to show you is like a square circle or not. One, a causal chain of contingent things. Two, it has a first or a beginning. And three, that beginning is caused. If you agree that that's not an impossibility, like a square circle, then look at what is suddenly also not impossible. The cause of the first contingent thing can't itself be contingent. So, premise two. In the possible case where the first contingent thing is caused to exist, a causally powerful necessary thing must cause it to exist. Therefore, a causally necessary thing possibly exists. It's as possible as that arrow. And this is big news because of that theorem that says any necessary thing that's genuinely possible necessarily exists. Atheists have long tried to say that we can't show a necessary thing is possible, but here we seem to do just that. If you want premises for Q&A or you want to see one proof for that theorem, you can get them on this page at beliefmap.org under God exists and then some necessary being exists. So 
We're talking about hypothesis modesty, and I, I want us to remember that our most elegant cosmology by far suggests the Big Bang was our first contingent event. And this seems certainly possible, and if it's possible, excuse me, this certainly seems possible, and this necessary entity is the perfect candidate for its cause. Regardless whether the Big Bang is the beginning or not, notice how modest the God hypothesis becomes in light of Turi's argument. One, we have a necessary entity. Two, it can possibly cause things to exist. Three, since it's necessary, it can exist without space. Four, without time. And five, without matter. And I think this is sounding suspiciously like God. Also, ask yourself, how could a necessary entity or event causally give rise to a non-necessary event? If all the conditions sufficient for causation are necessarily there, then how can the effect not also be necessarily there? Here's the solution. If the causation is non-necessitating, non-deterministic, and this is precisely the kind of causation that occurs when one freely chooses between alternatives. So that's uh, number six. But notice that free will is something had by persons. In asking about fundamental reality then, should we be that surprised if it's personal rather than impersonal? Consider this. Scientific explanations come in the form of laws acting on initial conditions. But that's precisely why science can never explain the nature nor existence of the fundamental laws and initial conditions themselves. I hope you see that. If, these, if those have an explanation, it has to be a non-scientific explanation. Well, why not a personal explanation? This would be an explanation in terms of an agent choosing to act on the basis of reasons. I think we're pretty much there, so why not? Why not take up that foundation for your reality? Well, what about this objection? Tori's argument said that there's a necessary being, but the thing could be a collection of some kind. It would just be more complex. For example, why can't the atheist or naturalist just say the universe is necessary? Four reasons. First, such a solution is ad hoc. This is being posited so atheism can keep up pace with theism, and not for independent reasons like what the theist had. Second, and relatedly, there are no arguments for the universe as being necessary, and it's unlikely that there will be. The universe on the standard model is composed of space, time, and 17 fundamental particles, each with, lo each with a loaded set of parameters and rules, and an argument that this specific set of particles, one after the other, with each of their specific properties, one after the other, the idea that, that, uh, that each of these things would be necessary seems pretty wild on the face of it. I occasionally hear someone say that maybe it's all explained by a fundamental equation. But in addition to being highly implausible, equations are abstract objects, like the number seven. And it's widely accepted that such entities do not stand in causal relations. Third, there are several papers published recently on the role of conceivability in discerning what is genuinely possible. It's generally believed that conceivability is a guide to discerning genuine possibility. And this is relevant because what the universe is, is determined by what it is fundamentally composed of. This in turn is relevant because phys uh, physicists can conceive of a different fundamental set of physical particles with different interactions. So we have prima facie reason to think that the universe is not necessary. Fourth, this is also extremely complex compared to theism. To show you how simple theism is, I want you to compare, excuse me, I want to compare God to a single electron. Remember that on theism, God is something like an unembodied mind, if not precisely that. Notice first then, you can't name the parts of the mind because it has no parts. It's more like an electron. Remember that electrons are leptons, and like all the fundamental particles in the standard model, it's commonly understood to have no substructure. That's simple. Second, like a single fundamental particle, what a limitless mind does is so simple that it's not mediated by deeper mechanisms. This is not magic. It's just that, like the electron, it has an irreducible causal power. Consider the electrons a, a negative charge. 
whereby it just repels other electrons. Similarly, a mind just produces thoughts. They may be very complex, but the unembodied mind by itself is not. Third, the mind has only two or three interesting properties that ground the others, notably power and knowledge. Moreover, fourth, as many analytic philosophers have noted, God even holds these in the simplest possible way with zero limitations added to them. So God has a lot in common with a single electron, but is even simpler. The atheist has to believe something better explains the contingent world, even if he doesn't know what it is. And I find it unlikely that his best hypothesis will be as elegant and modest as the God hypothesis. This should give us, I think, a decently high intrinsic probability for God, far more than for the extremely complex flying spaghetti monster. Let us turn now to the evidence. The second factor, I need to preface this section by saying I'm going to be presenting a lot of material, way more than Matt can address in a cross exam. So do not think uh, that just because Matt doesn't challenge me on something, that that means he doesn't have a response to it. <laughs> okay, so my main evidence tonight is the existence of a moral arena. Uh, this is not the moral argument. In fact, you don't have to believe objective right and wrong exist at all. I know many of you don't. Um, or a lot of the atheists don't, I know. Rather, a moral arena is simply a community of persons, uh, not necessarily humans, but persons in circumstances where they can engage in what we at least call moral decision making, where they can interact and mold themselves in what gets called morally significant ways. So I'm saying this is evidence for theism, and to define evidence, I'm using the standard likelihood principle. It says that our being in a moral arena is evidence for theism over atheism, just in case the probability, if you'll watch the slides, of a moral arena on the assumption of theism is greater than the probability of a moral arena on the assumption of atheism. This is like saying that John's fingerprints being on the murder weapon is evidence for John's being the murderer. Why? Because the probability of that observation is higher on the guilt hypothesis than on the innocence hypothesis. For our calculation then, we first need to ask, how much does the hypothesis of atheism in and of itself lead one to expect a moral arena? We'll consider that an all good God is not unlikely to bring about great or the greatest goods. And whether in fiction or reality, the greatest goods require a community of embodied moral agents. It's being embodies that really amplifies our abilities to express virtue, virtues like love, to engage virtuously in cooperative endeavors, and to make a difference, and to mold our character in morally significant ways. Because these are so clearly great, or the greatest goods, most will put the likelihood of a moral arena, given theism, somewhere between 10 and 90%. That's the kind of situation an all good God would plausibly bring about. I'm gonna be conservative though, and put it at 1%. But the nice thing about this calculation is, you get to pick your own number. If you've got a smartphone or something that you can write down on, I encourage you to join in. You're going to write down nine numbers total reflecting your position as we go. So write down your blue number first, and now we need to think about this green number, the likelihood of a moral arena on atheism. Uh, you could just guess, but this probability is fairly complex. Uh, your estimate's gonna be more informed if you break it up. For example, to get a moral arena on atheism, you need a universe. So you can figure that likelihood out, and from there, the likelihood that it would be life permitting, which you also need. All the way up until you get to a moral arena. The math wizards here know that this only works given the following assumption. If you get a moral arena on the hypothesis of atheism, this is the way it happens, which I think it is. At the end, you'll multiply these together to get your answer, and I'm gonna give you my numbers as we go for an example. Starting at the top, on the assumption that God does not exist, there seem to be no arguments that space, matter, or physics would exist. I should say that they would exist. It seems that a perfectly rational atheist who sees no evidence for a universe would reject belief in all that stuff. It's very weird. Uh, so think of like uh, an ingenious atheist who's never had sense perceptions. For him, matter, physics, and space would seem more improbable than any spaghetti monster seems to you. 
So I think the likelihood of a universe existing on atheism by itself is virtually nil. It's entirely unpredicted. From there, how likely is it that there would be a life-permitting universe in particular? Well, Brumfield says, quote, if you believe the equations of the world's leading cosmologists, the probability that the universe would turn out this way, life permitting, by chance, are infinitesimal. Luke Barnes recently published a review of the scientific literature, 200 plus papers, and says that he can only think of, quote, a handful of physicists that oppose this conclusion and piles and piles that support it. Here he lists some of the widely recognized constants that require fine tuning for life. For example, the cosmological constant is fine tuned to one part in 10 to the 120th power. And if you get it wrong, the universe either expands so rapidly that you only ever get the two lightest elements or it collapses within picoseconds of the Big Bang. And notice, in such circumstances, no life of any kind could evolve. In hopes of escaping this problem, some atheists are seeking a successful multiverse model with enough variation. Five quick problems though. One, infinite multiverse models face, among other things, the measure problem, where suddenly no events can be called rare or less common. So for example, you can't say it's unlikely that you will spontaneously combust in five seconds because that's just as common in the multiverse as you're not combusting. Two, a lot of the most popular multiverse models face the Boltzmann brains problem, which is this. It's a nasty consequence that you're probably just a brain with no body that's fluctuating into existence right now with the mistaken belief that you've had a rich history and that you're at a debate. And this is because the likelihood of such a thing fluctuating into existence is far higher than that of, the, of a universe with the relevant low entropy condition. Three, the models and model kinds face unique problems at the physics level, often harboring inconsistencies and often requiring especially wild and speculative mechanisms. Four, they aren't designed to go after instances of fine tuning. And five, the relevant versions also seem to require some fine tuning themselves, both new tunings and occasionally pushing the, the tuning that they wanted to rid themselves of into a new area like the proverbial wreck in the carpet. So I'm doing my calculation without paying mind to the multiverse idea. That means the likelihood of a life permitting universe remains incomprehensibly low for me, but I will massively highball it and just say it's less than 0.1%. Next, given there is a life permitting universe, how much should you expect that life would actually arise in it? Well, if the situation on our planet's any indicator, you shouldn't think it's very likely. On their 125th anniversary, Science Magazine published a top 25 and top 125 problems in science based on extensive academic polling. In polls like this, the origin of life problem is always center stage. Klaus Dos echoes the widespread sentiment of origin of life researchers writing, quote, more than 30 years of experimentation on the origin of life in the fields of chemical and molecular evolution have, let, have uh, led to a better perception of the immensity of the problem of the origin of life on Earth rather than to its solution. At present, all discussions on principal theories and experiments in the field either end in stalemate or in a confession of ignorance. So without God, no, I am. What are we here? Now you might hear of the RNA world hypothesis in school, but that doesn't even attempt to solve half the problems. And for the problems it does go after, it still runs into huge issues. Carl Woos, the originator of the RNA world hypothesis, confessed, in one sense, the origin of life problem today remains what it was in the time of Darwin, one of the great unsolved riddles of science. He adds, while we do not have a solution, we now have an inkling of the magnitude of the problem. So without God, I think a life-permitting universe predicts life about as much as a cell phone-permitting universe permits cell phones. It's not anywhere near as high as 10% expected for me, but I'm going to put it at 10% anyways. Next, given there is an origin of life, how likely is it that complex brains or something that functions like them at least would evolve in the universe? Well, you might have noticed another of the top 25 questions just below. What determines species diversity? Or better, what drives evolution? Notice they aren't questioning common descent. The question is largely about neo-Darwinism, the modern synthesis. And this is the standard view that we were all taught in school, that natural selection acting on random genetic variations is what explains 
all the diversity of life. So that same process, which explains how pre-existing designs can get optimized for a situation, can over time produce all this complex engineering and ultimately produce brains of some kind. However, the sufficiency of the modern synthesis is very controversial today. Eugene Kunin is one of the most renowned living evolutionary biologists. And on the recent 150th anniversary of Darwin's Origin of Species, Kunin's entry in a top journal was the introductory piece. The journal is Trends in Genetics, and the piece was a synopsis of where the field of evolutionary biology is today. Kunin writes, quote, the summary of the state of affairs on the 150th anniversary of the origin is somewhat shocking. In the post-genomic era, all major tenets of the modern synthesis are, if not outright overturned, replaced by a new and incomparably more complex vision of the key aspects of evolution. So, not to mince words, the modern synthesis is gone. As noted in this paper, how evolutionary adaptations and innovations originate is one of the most profound questions in evolutionary biology. Let me recommend three papers quickly. I chose three that are free online. This one, Biological Theory Postmodern Evolution, is on 16 very high profile researchers who are thinking about alternatives. This one, The Fate of Darwinism Evolution After the Modern Synthesis, covers a history of this overturn. And this paper, host an easy to read debate, uh, does evolutionary theory need a rethink, where both sides agree that evolutionary theory is true, but is radically different than what it was just a decade ago. They agree that there is a raging debate over which mechanisms are sufficient or will appear in the final theory, and whether they can still honestly call it the modern synthesis. Here's how this relates to my argument. If I were an atheist, I would look around, see that there's all this evolved life, and conclude that it is a fact that some non-God mechanism did it. That's a big part of the reason the first version of the modern synthesis was called a fact. For this calculation, though, the factness has to come in a way that you could present, again, to a maximally rational version of yourself watching first life form four billion years ago. And you can't tell them the future. That's analogous to question begging. The only, you can only reason with him about what might happen and why. With the death of neo-Darwinism, though, I think you would completely fail to convince this rational version of yourself. So I can't bring myself to put this higher than 1%. Next, given that brains do evolve, what's the likelihood that there would be consciousness? Notice that nothing in known physics would allow someone to look at the brain and conclude, hey, there's someone in there. Uh, this thing has first-person experiences. So you can't predict consciousness that way. You might think, well, only brains with subjective experiences would avoid pain and try to survive. So we can predict that consciousness would evolve because it's adaptive. This also is wrong. Only people who believe in souls uh, think that the mind can affect the brain like that. Almost all atheists say your body would do what it does even if no mental life existed because the brain is a physically closed machine. All your neurons would fire just the same without you and move your body the same adaptive way. Evolutionary history would be identical with or without consciousness. So simply given that brains evolve without God, I'd no more expect them to be conscious than I would the internet to be conscious or stars or an electron. So for me, this is less than 1%. Next, what's the likelihood that any of these conscious blobs of matter would have beliefs? Consciousness doesn't imply beliefs, and again, looking at the conscious brain, no known physics would lead atheists to predict such an obscure thing. As usual, at best, he can be entirely surprised and learn it after the fact. So it's again less than 1% for me. Then on atheism, we need to know why, just because beliefs exist, that an atheist would expect these very particular kinds of beliefs to exist. Beliefs about right and wrong. Even if these were adaptive, naturalists say our concept of morality depends on an unknown, highly contingent evolutionary history that, like humanity itself, easily might never have evolved, even in a universe full of alien life. But then why expect it to occur even once? I'm going to be super charitable here and put this at 50% for me. I'll also be charitable and assume that uh, these are the only things atheism needs for a moral arena. 
Now we can multiply these numbers together, uh, which again, I felt were often charitable. And here you can see my personal calculation uh, for how expected a moral arena is on atheism. Then you plug it in here. And as long as your blue number is greater than the green, the moral arena for you is evidence for theism over atheism. In my case, you can see it's uh, very powerful evidence. Notice, this is not a God of the gaps argument. And that's because things like wave particle duality or the other top 25 mysteries in science are equally unexpected on atheism. Those are not evidence for God. The stuff I'm showing here is evidence. If I had time, I'd present several additional evidences for theism, including evidences from objective morality and more. Still, I think things are looking pretty good for theism so far, both in terms of its intrinsic probability, where we saw from reason alone that a being like this has to exist anyways, and its explanatory, and its explanatory power. In the absence of comparable counter evidence, I think we can be very justified in believing that God exists. Thank you. I don't have any you don't slides. Have a PowerPoint, so I have to worry about it. Our second speaker tonight is Matt Delahunty. Matt is an American public speaker, avid gamer, bright fashion spokesperson. <laughs> magician and internet personality and was the president of the atheist community of Austin from 2006 to 2013. He's hosted the Austin-based webcast and cable access television show The Atheist Experience since 2005 and formerly hosted the internet radio show Nonprofits Radio. A Southern Baptist for more than 25 years, he sought to become a minister and his investigation of his religious views led him to reject supernatural claims. I just he now identifies as a skeptic, no humanist, and atheist. Portion. It's just a he is a founder and contributor of the Counter Apologetics yeah, that's, that's, that's Encyclopedia, that's the, Iron Chariots, as well as the Atheist Debates I, I Patreon like Project, <laughs> yeah. which are dedicated to I providing the understanding of tools for <laughs> more effective discussions between theists and atheists. Well, hopefully people he is regularly engaged in formal debates and travels the world speaking to secular organizations, churches, and university groups on religion, philosophy, skepticism, atheism, humanism, and magic. He's married to Beth Presswood, a microbiologist, and one of the Austin Chronicles listener selected best podcast, Godless Bitches. <laughs> they live in Austin, Texas with their four cats, two snakes, and the occasional scorpion. Speaking to the topic, does God exist? Please welcome Matt Dillahunty. Did I write that introduction or did somebody else? Because that took forever. I'm busy. I'm a busy guy. Go ahead. I'm, I'm really happy to be here at the Bible and Beer Consortium. Uh, even though I'm not much of a beer guy. So if it was the Bible and Tequila Consortium, which I saw some afterwards. I, I'd rather not debate drunk. Uh, maybe we have like the absinthe section for like the French <laughs> philosophers. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know much about Blake before I got the introduction, was told who I was going to be debating. I, I try not to tailor my talk to who I'm engaging instead of preparing for arguments. Uh, but I did listen to a little bit, and, and right away he reminded me of uh, John Ferrer, who I've debated a couple times and will debate again. Uh, I like them both. I don't look at these things as WWE events like some other people do. I, I really want to have conversations despite what you may have seen on TV or with Cy. <laughs> uh, so we may not have the same vocabulary as a echo, yep. We may not have the same vocabulary, we may end up debating terminology at some point. I don't mind semantic discussions, they're about meaning, which is important. But in this format, I hope we can avoid tangents which delve into labels because we disagree on the atheist label for sure. Uh, something we'll get into some other day, I'm sure. And focus on the task at hand, does God exist? When I was a kid, I enjoyed Ripley's Believe It or Not. And it was a show that purported to demonstrate amazing facts and feats that, while seemingly unbelievable or extraordinary at face value, were actually real, or at least most of them were. Uh, I was a Bible-believing Southern Baptist Christian, and it was very clear to me that what you believe is a separate issue from what's actually true. God either exists or does not exist, 
irrespective of whether you believe he exists, believe he doesn't exist, or reject both. For any given claim, and note that I'm talking about a claim here, not a question, there are only two possibilities. Either you believe the claim or you do not believe the claim. If you do not believe the claim, in other words, you reject it, that doesn't mean that you accept the contradictory claim. By way of example, if there were a jar of gumballs here, uh, one might ask, is the number of gumballs odd or even? After all, we know that it must be one or the other. And about that question, you might have a number of different positions. You could believe that it's odd. You could believe that it's even. You could reject neither or either. Um, but when you consider the statement, the number of gumballs is odd. You either believe that or you don't. There's no middle ground. Believe and not believe are direct law obligations. And to propose a middle ground on that single claim would be to violate the foundations of reason. This is where we get into confusing uh, language about how we talk about these things because we're thinking about a question when we really need to be addressing a statement. The default position should be to, re to reject or disbelieve all claims until such time as there's sufficient reason to accept them, which could be really easy for some claims. For something like gumballs, we don't default to it's odd until you prove it's even or it's even until you prove it's odd because we recognize that those are equally likely and that they're both properly testable and falsifiable and that the impact of being wrong is negligible. But when it comes to things like trials in a court of law, in the United States, we have a presumption of innocence until guilt is proven. There's a burden of proof set on the prosecution. They're raising a claim the defendant is guilty, and as a member of a jury, you either render a verdict of guilty or not guilty. And a verdict of not guilty isn't a declaration of innocence, and it doesn't say anything at all about what you're actually convinced of. It just says what you're not convinced of. You may be convinced the defendant is actually innocent, or you may just not have been convinced of guilt. You might even be convinced that he probably did it, but the evidence wasn't sufficient for you to render a verdict beyond a reasonable doubt or to a reasonable certainty or whatever the standard is for that trial. So for clarity, I find God not guilty of existing. The claim some God exists has, to my mind, not met its burden of proof. Whether or not I also find God innocent of the charge of existing is secondary and irrelevant to whether or not his guilt has been established. It seems to frustrate some people when I defend what Blake and others might call the non-theistic position rather than defending the proposition that God, in fact, does not exist. But that's not my problem. We think it preposterous to walk into a courtroom with one side trying to prove guilt, the other try trying to prove innocence. What if neither of them succeed? Where are we then? What do we do with this person who's been accused? We don't know, and that's why we have burdens of proof. We have default positions for other reasons, because for any claim to be of use, it must be falsifiable meaning that there must be some observation which would demonstrate that the claim is false. We address claims and not questions for those reasons and many more because it gets very messy. There's a reason that syllogisms don't contain questions, they contain statements. And when we move away from that, we muddy the playing field. All that said, I do believe the answer to the question, does God exist, is no. And I'll explain why, but the important point is that the time to believe any claim, including God exists or God doesn't exist, is after it's met its burden of proof. And a failure to demonstrate that the answer is no doesn't mean that you're justified in thinking it's reasonable to believe that the answer is yes. When I debated Cy Ten Bruggenkate, uh, the first premise of his argument was, it is reasonable to believe that which is true. And I failed to point out that while the premise is very tempting, it's actually false. It flew right by me, it flew by most of the people in the room, it's false. And he said, oh, I don't think Matt will challenge that because that's just the definition of reasonableness. He completely buffaloed me. I addressed it later on. The fact that something is true is separate from whether or not you have good reason to think it's true. It may be true that aliens are right now en route to the Earth to take over the planet, but I don't have sufficient reason to think that's the case, and so I cannot reasonably believe it, even if it happens to be true. And it's worth noting that it may also be reasonable to believe something that is, in fact, false. This is the realm where magicians and con men pray by selling you something that's false, by making it appear to be reasonable based on insufficient information. So first, the reasons I do not believe that a God exists. Simply this, I don't think the claim has been established and met its burden of proof. There are a host of classical arguments for the existence of God and they've been considered, rejected, reformed, rejected, dusted off and polished up and rejected for as long as we've been attempting to reasonably evaluate this claim that a God exists. There are very few truly new arguments, if any, and all of them are examples of trying to fit the argument and evidence to the conclusion one prefers rather than following the evidence where it leads or acknowledging that we simply do not have sufficient information to reach a particular conclusion. Some of them are arguments that the observations about the world necessarily mean that a God exists. Others are arguments that the world 
probably points to a god. I'm not sure how one can calculate the probability of something that you can't investigate and for which you have no concrete examples. If you're trying to do a Bayesian analysis, you'll end up with a zero in either the numerator or the denominator somewhere, and that's a big mistake. Still others aren't arguments for the existence of God, but are arguments for belief that a God exists, irrespective of whether one actually does, and they rely on, rely on fallacious appeals to consequences. Things like, if there is no God, then we have no absolute grounding for morality, which isn't necessarily true, but if it were true, then what's the reason for concluding that there is a God instead of concluding that we don't have an absolute grounding for reality? or for morality. There's a core problem that often gets overlooked, and as far as I can tell, there's been no demonstration of any mechanism that would allow us to confirm the existence of anything supernatural. And if you can't do that, without that mechanism, speculations about the nature of the supernatural, the possibility of the supernatural, the probability of the supernatural, whether or not it can interact with reality or manifest in reality, are equally equivalent, or, or roughly equivalent, to flights of fancy. Without that mechanism, Claims that the supernatural has, in fact, interacted with reality are simply unfounded assertions. They may be correct, but we have no rational grounds on which to determine that. The appeals to the supernatural are untestable and unfalsifiable. It's as if the prosecutions walked in and claimed the defendant stole the diamonds by teleporting into the vault without even attempting to establish that teleportation is possible or that it was the means used by this defendant in this instance. I'm not claiming that there's no supernatural realm. I'm just pointing out what has been recognized for centuries. We have no mechanism to conform or to confirm that the supernatural exists or can interact with reality. This is something that Blake alluded to when he talked about science can't solve this problem, it seems. And this is why science rests on the, on the foundation of methodological naturalism and why courtrooms disallow spectral evidence. If someone came to you and claimed that they discovered some important truth and they could offer no mechanism by which the truth could be independently verified, would you believe them? Should you believe them? I don't think you should, and indeed I cannot. This is the position we're in with gods and other supernatural claims. I cannot believe them because they have not met their burden of proof and they don't seem to be able to do so. My friend Arndt says that creationist claims fall into two categories, not evidently true and evidently not true. I don't believe God exists because the claim is not evidently true. But more than just not believing that God exists, I'm further convinced that God does not exist. I'm not asserting this as a, a claim to absolute certainty, that I've cracked this and scientifically proved that there are no gods. This is just what I think is reasonable. And yes, it does fall prey to the problem that if you can't calculate the probabilities, how did you determine that it's unlikely? That problem still exists in this. I think that the claims, though, at least the god of classical theism and the various subcategories that fall under that, falls into evidently not true. I think the classical theistic god and most, if not all, of the gods that have been proposed throughout history qualify for that label. Not all of the objections that I'll list are apply to all of the god claims, but all of them apply to some god claim. A god that exists outside of space and time seems to not only or seems to be not true by definition, as existence is temporal and spatial. If something exists for zero seconds and occupies zero space, what does it mean to say that it exists? The normal explanation is that the word exist being used here is kind of a placeholder for whatever exist would mean outside of space and time and doesn't actually mean exist in the sense that we use it in reality. Okay, then use a different word and don't say God exists and confuse people. Essentially, God doesn't exist in reality, but he air quotes exists outside of reality. That doesn't solve the problem, though, because we have no reason to think that there's any such thing as outside of space and time or that anything could be there in any meaningful sense. The god of classical theism, one who's omnipresent, omnibenevolent, omniscient, omnipotent, is plagued by countless potential fallacies for each of those terms and for the interactions of those terms. And we don't have to go to the glib, rock so big that he can't lift it or burrito so hot he can't eat it to see this. The real philosophical problems with these absolutes, these absolute ultimates, were so weighty that modern theologians have redefined the terms, and you saw them on Blake's sheet, so that no omnipotent no longer means omnipotent, it means maximally powerful or possessing all logically possible power. But these are more ill-defined flights of fancy. They're, they are as ad hoc as you can get. Hey, our old definition of omnipotent didn't work, so let's come up with a new one. If you don't have any idea how much power, which is sometimes replaced with capability, is logically possible, have you really improved the situation by saying that something has all the power that it can have? 
Haven't you just limited God? What if it's not actually possible to be maximally powerful? Or what if the creation of the universe, one of the credits the omnipotent is grounded with, doesn't fall within that realm? How do they determine that it's possible for any thinking agent to actually do that? Maybe there's a limit to the maximal possibility of a thinking agent, but what the universe can do, or what the multiverse can do, or what the cosmos can do, falls under a different category. Certainly there's a difference between what I can do and what some of you can do. How do they determine it's possible for any thinking agent to do that? Can this thinking agent make himself cease to exist? Has he done that? How do you know? Once he's done it, can he come back? In the end, it seems like a tautology that God can do whatever God can do. I'm not a big fan of the problem of evil as a response to theism in almost any form. I do, though, find the problem of divine hiddenness to be a compelling reason to believe that there isn't a God, at least not one that cares. Why, if there's a God who cares, isn't this obvious common knowledge? Why is it that the best arguments for his existence are complicated things that only a tiny portion of the population can even comprehend? Why do we have to learn so many dead languages and become veritable experts in many fields in order to have any hope of finding this God? Why for gods like the biblical God was it once perfectly acceptable to interact with reality, but not now? Why was the Damascus Road experience good enough for Saul, but not the rest of us? Why is he playing favorites? Why require us to believe claim on claims that can't be properly investigated? Why, if he exists, does he seem to be playing an interminable game of hide-and-go-seek? <laughs> if you never met your father, but your mom assured you that he was alive and loved you and was coming to see you next weekend, and she told you this every week, and it never happened, and then she told you that you had to really, really want him to come visit you before he'd show up, and that it's your fault that he hasn't shown up, <laughs> wouldn't you reach a point where you'd have to recognize that continuing to believe her claim was an obvious mistake? People often ask, what would it take to convince me that God exists? And I used to give glib answers, but I have a better one. I don't know. But if there's a God, under the classical definitions, that God should know exactly what it would take to convince me, and has not done so. And the fact that this hasn't happened demonstrates that either this God doesn't exist, or doesn't want me to know that he exists, yet. Either way, not my problem. Can this maximally powerful being, is he capable of convincing me? Can he communicate in a way that I can comprehend? If so, then why hasn't it happened? And if not, what good is omnipotence if it's limited his ability to communicate with this creation? And if he created me so that I'm too stupid to comprehend or incapable of understanding, isn't that his fault? But it's worse than that because the invisible and the non-existent are indistinguishable to us. If someone told you they had a friend that existed outside of space and time who wouldn't offer any reasonable demonstration of its existence, I think it would be fair to conclude tentatively and not as an absolute position that this being doesn't actually exist, at least not in any meaningful sense. Some apologists might argue that God must stay hidden or it infringe on our free will. And depending on your definition of free will, we may or may not have it, so that's another conversation. But the God of the Bible apparently had no problem infringing on free will when he hardened Pharaoh's heart or when he purportedly interacted with people in ways that clearly demonstrated his power right up to Saul's Damascus Road experience. For those who believe in a Satan, you have here a being who was in God's presence and clearly interacted with God yet was free to rebel. So hiddenness doesn't seem to infringe on free will if you accept that there's a Satan. Well, it's a mystery. It's all God's plan. Then it's a stupid plan. <laughs> That's, I'm not, I'm not laugh line glib. I don't think that an omniscient being should be more stupid than we are. The Bible is a comedy of this God's ineptness that's so bizarre that when I was in Australia, I did like a one act, one man play about this. And I, I, what I'm saying here is not meant to be insulting. When it comes to intelligence, there's a seemingly endless pool of facts. And there seems to be no end to what you, the facts that you can know. But there does seem to be a limit on the foundations of thought. Telling you that God is just so much smarter than me that the things that he's said to have done that seem stupid to me are actually brilliant doesn't make sense and can't make sense. Even if I'm wrong, this is just the way I have to look at it. Telling me that the acts that are attributed to God that I look at and see as immoral are actually moral because God can see so much farther than I can doesn't solve a problem at all. And if God can't clear this up, I'm stuck. Why create an entire universe with billions of planets and billions of stars that have no discernible effect on us if your focus is us? There doesn't seem to be any good reason for that. 
And it reminds me of Tim the Enchanter from Monty Python's The Holy Grail, who has so much power that he's just randomly shooting out fireballs. Uh, I just can't contain all the power. Let me create more galaxies, more galaxies. <laughs> and Tracy Harris has described this universe as the rough equivalent of the sort that Wile E. Coyote would come up with. <laughs> billions of years of expansion and millions of years of evolution that all led to this intended species and insignificant blip on the cosmic scale. And it seems that the claim is that some being exists in a way that is totally unreal. How then is its existence distinguishable from its non-existence? And from our perspective, if they're logically identical or logically indistinguishable, then they're equivalent. It might be better to say God isn't real than God doesn't exist. Because God doesn't exist unless we alter the world, word exist to include things outside of reality, which opens the door to all sorts of other things outside of reality. And some of those things are mutually exclusive which demonstrates that all the attempts for the, to argue for the existence of God involve some form of special pleading. God is a special type of being that exists in a special way that isn't like any other existy thing that we've ever experienced. Leading the evidence toward a preferred conclusion versus following it where it leads is what we see from apologists, or what I see. Would we as rational beings with a proper understanding of science begin to try to solve mysteries in this universe by appealing to a supernatural realm that we have no way to verify? This is a mistake of our less informed ancestors and it has poisoned our thinking in all sorts of areas. We're desperate to prove that our ancestors were onto something, that they, this co compel, compulsion to seek out the divine had an actual divine source rather than a mistake in our thinking. We reform arguments and try to massage and construct them so that we can at most say that we were able to construct some sort of argument that seems consistent with the observations and has not yet been shown to be an error. I'm willing to say that our ancestors knew less about the world and knew less about what was reasonable and moral, and that their ill-informed conclusions about the supernatural, including gods, should go the way of their ill-formed conclusions about a flat earth and an earth at the center of the universe, and that evil spirits cause disease. There's no good reason to think a god exists, and plenty of reasons to think that no god exists. After all, most theists who have chosen a specific god think that all of the other gods don't exist. They don't just disbelieve those other gods, they believe that those other gods do not exist. I'm agreeing with them, all of them. <laughs> we are going now to uh, go to cross examination. I stole one here. Take a copy of your thing. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Okay. You stole my pen too. Sheet, I did. You have no morals. Don't tell the other. people though they can hear you. Um, we're running this via corridor exchange. Is that the term for Q and A? Going to have to be no booing, no cheering, no applause. Uh, Don't tell me you're going to stand just to make me look now. fat and old. <laughs> Let me give Blake uh, my mic and then we'll Hold on. start. I apologize. This is, I have to pull up my notes. Here, you're going to have to give me a second. No problem. Can't, you don't make the rules here. Sorry? Um, I, I don't care. Uh, let Matt start. Oh, sure. sure. Matt, 10 minutes. Hold on. Let him. Yeah, let him, let him get ready and then. Okay. Then the feeding frenzy can begin. you questions yeah and then you'll have 10 minutes to ask me questions and then we'll let all the people who are talking through my questions ask questions of their own <laughs> hey 
See, I can be passive aggressive from the stage. <laughs> All right, so um, I had some I had some questions. It's really not uh, a rebuttal portion, so yeah. may, maybe we'll work through it through the course of these questions and stuff. Uh, I actually just kind of jotted down a couple questions that I was interested in just in general from your view. Mm -hmm. um, and this will be an obvious potential trap to begin with. So I, would you consider it wrong, morally wrong, to drown an infant? Yeah. Is there any circumstance in which this would be morally good or even morally neutral to drown an infant? For me to drown? I don't For anyone either. to drown an infant? Um, I don't think that it would be morally good. Well, I mean, I think some, I don't have rights over life, so I don't think I can, I don't think I can, but I mean, if you're leading into the question of can, can God do something like yes. that, I think God has the right to take away uh, life. So if God drowns an infant, there's nothing immoral about that? I think God can kill any of us whenever, correct? I'm not, I'm not questioning whether or not he can as a matter of power. No, I meant morally, as in morally, it's morally oh, acceptable. I okay. think God has rights over life. Because you had made a statement at one point uh, in that atheistically speaking thing that uh, a bad, evil God is impossible. So if you've proven that God is bad, then you've proven that God doesn't exist, at least the traditional God. Hmm. But if what you're saying is that all the things, and I don't know if it's all the things, but at least this first one that right, was obvious. Right, it wouldn't be all the things. So oh. I, I don't think God could lie, for instance. But I do think God has rights over life. So, so in the Bible, when God intentionally deceives people, that's not God lying? So first off, we want to make sure that the debate stays on the existence of God in general. In response to that question, sure. though, there's a, I mean, some philosophers want to make a distinction between deception and, and lying. So I'd, I'd have to explore what's going okay. on there. Well, this isn't actually about the existence of God, because if you could demonstrate that this was an actually an immoral act that God took, then God wouldn't exist, according to your statement. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, yeah, I just was latching onto the Bible reference. My mind jumps. Yeah, no, no, He's no. going to the Bible. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I would love to debate what's <laughs> actually in the Bible or the Christian God, but, you know, right. if we're going to go on with the kind of general classical theist stuff. Um, so how is it not a mistake in using Bayes' theorem to, so normally when we use Bayes' theorem, when we talk about uh, evaluating priors, we don't just hypothesize something that has no examples. We talk about this particular explanation versus all these others. And in any other scenario where we'd use Bayes' theorem, theorem um, the proposed explanation is something that is real in, in the world, as, as a plausible. We're actually trying to compare the, the possibility or the plausibility of two explanations. So like if, the example that I used of, of a, a prosecutor saying that he teleported in there. Mm. Well, can you, can, wouldn't it be unfair to, to try to do a Bayesian analysis of whether or not teleportation was what was the best explanation for this if we have no basis and no priors to show that teleportation is real? Actually, I think that would go into the priors. I mean, so you have an, an opinion and evaluation on the likelihood of teleportation occurring. So, I mean, we could, we could try to, to think about it. I mean, you'd want to ask yourself if there's any um, uh, challenge in physics that would, uh, that, would, that would arise in virtue of trying to make one object teleport to another. Um, you'd have to figure out, you know, nothing on Earth, of course, has the, the power to bring about teleportation. So you'd have to think about the likelihood that if maybe aliens did it or God did it. But if you think about aliens, uh, and again, you're, what's the likelihood that aliens would want to teleport that particular object? That's going to be very low unless you have an argument. And the likelihood that God would want to teleport an object is going to be very low unless you can give an argument like I did in the moral arena for God's wanting to do such a thing. So that actually does go into the priors. So what, what if my prior for your morality on theism was zero? Um, of theism is zero? If it's zero, then no evidence can affect it. And, and you're right, then it's, it's game over. But um, hopefully, I mean, look, if, if you're going to set it to zero, you better have, you, that would mean you're philosophically no, no. certain, like, like in the kind of certainty that you know, I know I'm here, I, the Cartesian certainty so, that God doesn't exist. So there's a difference, though, between how likely is this on the assumption of theism mm -hmm. versus, doesn't that also entail, like, you, you did just the assumption of theism, then when you get to atheism, you go to the universe and all the other things that get you to multiply to a very, very small number, and it seems to me that um, on theism, we would have to do pretty much the same, yes. and we just started with a number. Where's the demonstration of, of the likelihood of theism? So 
you'll remember that in the opening statement I pointed out that this is a very complex question precisely because the only way to get a moral arena on theism, and I said, look, this is the math wizards know, this is the big assumption, and I, I think it is, the only way you can get a moral arena on theism is through a universe and through there being a brains and so forth. Brains of any kind. But here's my point, is that when it comes to the God question, um, you, you don't have to do something like that. You can, you can immediately look at it. In fact, I, I will let you uh, put whatever intermediaries you'd like. It, there's no problem with doing that. I just don't think there's going to be something like that. You can jump immediately from uh, knowing that God is all good to having expectations about what God would do. Sure, and I have no, no problem with that. The problem here is actually a little bit different, and that is that even if it means nothing to me to say that X is more likely on theism than on atheism, because that doesn't tell me about what, not anything at all about whether or not theism is actually true. The fact that something is improbable. So like if I'm dealing cards. Can, can I interrupt? Sure. So you're saying it, it doesn't say anything about whether theism is likely to be true. What about, I mean, would you say that if, if a proposition is more likely on hypothesis one than hypothesis two, and we can establish that proposition, would, we, would you say that that proposition is evidence for hypothesis one? What I'm saying is that you could come up with a hypothesis that you could ultimately, in this case, assign a higher, higher likelihood to. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing, theism, the propositions of theism, is an attempt to explain all of the things that are seemingly unexplainable. So if you construct an explanation, no matter whether or not it's possible or likely. Sorry, I don't think it's trying to explain all the things that are seemingly unexplainable. So really? remember that, really, yeah, remember that God of the Gaps slide at the end where I explained. Look, where you for, said it wasn't the God of the Gaps, well, but that doesn't mean I well, agree. Well, let me explain it to you. So for remember, for, if you take those 25 mysteries, those top 25, or yeah, 25 mysteries in mm -hmm. science, and you do the exact same thing, look, how likely is this on theism and how likely is this on atheism? then the likelihood for all of them, except for the two that I pointed out, is going to be identical. And if something fits just as well on theism and atheism, then by definition it's not evidence for theism or atheism. It's the same. The whole reason I picked out those specific instances is because they are more likely on theism than atheism. So this is, so first of all, there's, I noticed that on all the slides you, you had S5 there, which was like taunting me, because <laughs> if, I've, if I've said one thing at all about modal logic, it's that I reject S5. Uh, as do a lot of other people. A lot of, there's a lot of people who raise objections to the S5 axiom, which I'm not going to bore you all with. To me, and maybe it's because I don't have the philosophical background and some of the others, this seems like here's a problem that we don't have a solution to. And it's big. So let's propose a solution and then say that on the assumption of this solution, the probability of this expectation is very high. Sorry, what does this uh, relate this back to S5? What did that have to do with This has nothing to do with S5. Oh, do I get to respond to that? If you'd like to. I... Okay. Do you, just to make sure, to like, do you know what S5 is? Yes. Okay, what, it, just, what is it? Because some people have a misunderstanding. What do you think it is? So S5 is the axiom in modal logic that, that takes uh, a necessary, if something is probably necessary, then it is necessary. Is that say that again? I, I'm not going to get the, the actual phrasing right. It's, it's, it is the point where you get from, if it exists in a possible world, then it, if it necessarily exists in a possible world, then it necessarily exists. No. Okay, so this is, so a lot of people think it's this, is uh, if, if it's possible that something necessarily exists, then it necessarily exists. Okay. Okay, and I understand a lot of, that's not what actually S5 is. So S5 what, is is possibly a, entails necessarily possibly a, and the thing I want to point out is that, um, so this is a quote from Timothy Williamson, he's an Oxford professor, he says, indeed most metaphysicians accept S5 as the propositional modal logic of modality. This is, yeah. this is very standard um, in, in modal logic, which is widely accepted and taught in universities. But the, the, there are objections to this idea that we're talking about possibilities and extrapolating from that necessary truths to some extent. Right, that and some of that's mistake. right, and some of that's surprising. That's the whole point. That's why the theorem was so important. Sure. So, but to me, this so if you, if you have a problem, hey, we don't know we can't investigate beyond the, the Planck time, so we don't know how the universe started. Hey, what if there's a magical being that can do this? Then on the hypothesis of this magical being, we would expect this. Mm -hmm. And on the hypothesis without this magical being Oh, all of a sudden it becomes very unlikely. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't tell me anything at all about whether or not this magical being actually did it. What, 
What it will tell you is that this piece of data that fits better on the magical being hypothesis, and you can't just say the magical being, you want to say the magical sure, being okay. explains it in some way. So, oh. so the idea, well, because it's just, I, I don't see that it explains it. See, I don't see that God is an explanation for anything. It's an attempt to solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. So just by definition of evidence, if a piece of data or observation fits better on one hypothesis than another, then it counts as evidence for that hypothesis. All I have to do is show that this data fits better on theism. It's, it's less surprising on theism than on atheism. Your objection, Matt, I think where you're actually getting hung up is you're picking up on the fact that, look, you can have like a, a hypothesis that's very ad hoc, that has a very low prior probability, and in that case, no matter what the evidence is, it's not going to salvage a, uh, a hypothesis that has a sufficiently low prior right. probability. Right, I see God as that kind of and ad hoc. And that's why I spent so much time at the beginning of my presentation talking about what the intrinsic probability of the hypothesis of God, because these are the types of considerations you want to bring into question in order to evaluate intrinsic probability. I, I still can't see this as anything other than, see, see, because what, this pathway that you walk through as you go through and explain it starts with if something is conceivable, then that leads to it being possible. And from there we go to if it's necessarily possible in some world, then et cetera, et cetera, on down to this is now the best explanation. Well, I gave several arguments. There are several points in favor of possibility. Conceivability does not entail possibility. So there are some mathematical theorems. Oh, because like, I, I had it down that you said that. It's evidence. Maybe, maybe say Here's what philosophers say. They say conceivability is evidence of possibility. But there are some problems. I disagree. Okay, well, there are some problems. Oh, is that all? I just have one more question. Oh. <laughs> I need my microphone. I, I don't even know. Uh... Give me my good one. Oh. So, if we're sitting down at, at a table and I deal out cards to everybody and you end up with 13 spades, that's really unlikely. With 13 spades. Okay. Yeah, like you, you're familiar with the deck of cards. I should have asked that. I'm a magician. I should ask the question first. <laughs> uh, so it's really unlikely. And so we sit down to try to figure out, uh, it is in fact on the hypothesis that I cheated, you would expect that, and it would turn out to be more probable than on the hypothesis that I cheated, you would get 13 spades than on the hypothesis that I didn't cheat. Mm -hmm. Have we determined anything about whether or not I actually cheated? Wait, wait. Uh, no, you haven't. No, is that that's all. That's my entire point. So in, yeah. Good. Sorry, I might, I might have missed that. Did I miss something with that? <laughs> no, I just. Wait, is there? Is there? Sorry, just real quick. Is are there? This is going to be a little bit embarrassing. Are there thirteen spades in your deck? Yes. Okay, and you're saying that all thirteen. I dealt, were dealt. out the cards. I dealt you thirteen cards. And you got be, all thirteen spades. Ace and that's evidence king. that you're cheating, but it's not proof. Is, is that what the, what the conclusion was? Yes, it's more likely that I cheated yes. than that it happened. Yeah, yeah, that would be evidence that you cheated. Yes, uh, but it wouldn't confirm that I cheated. It wouldn't prove that you cheated, correct. And it's possible that it could have happened without me cheating. That's correct. Cool, that's my entire point. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay. Blake? You have 10 minutes. I brought a spare. I brought a spare. He a spare. I drink lots of tea. Uh, if I don't minutes. have to pee during your questions, it'll be a miracle and then you win. <laughs> After this we break, so yeah, we great. Just 10 minutes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so naturalism is the view that says that nothing has a supernatural explanation. And I want to know, do, do you believe that there's any evidence for naturalism over almost the naturalism, which is uh, the theistic type of view where 99.99999% of things have natural explanations. So are you asking me about, so there's a difference between philosophical naturalism and methodological naturalism. Are you asking me about philosophical naturalism? Philosophical, correct. Because I don't know that I've identified as a philosophical naturalist. As a matter of fact, I've rejected it many times. Okay. Because so, I think it takes a step too far in asserting, so philosophical naturalism is the claim that there is no supernatural, there's only the natural. And methodological naturalism says we can't say anything about the supernatural, so we're going to do our science by only appealing to natural things until such time as somebody comes as a mechanism for the supernatural. So I'm a methodological naturalist, not a philosophical naturalist. I, I got the impression um, that you were, so why do you, think, why do you think that we use methodological naturalism? Because there's no demonstrated mechanism to verify the supernatural. 
I don't think that's why we use uh, uh, methodological naturalism. I mean, methodological naturalism historically is something that theists, theists uh, proposed, because, and it had more to do with the delegation of responsibilities um, in the science. The idea was that, look, we don't want to, in order to determine whether uh, God was responsible for something, you have to take into account both the science and the philosophy. Yes. And we, we did not want to have to make scientists get their doctorates in, in philosophy. So uh, remember, sure. on theism, 99.999% of explanations out there are naturalistic. God created that kind of world for a reason. And if that's true... I don't see that as a naturalistic explanation, okay. but okay. to well, say God look, created for a reason... If that's is, true, if that's true, then, then a naturalistic scientific approach to the world is going to be very, very successful. But and what, we don't want our scientists having to get a degree to try to make those higher order decisions about whether God was involved. So sort of the academic machine that we set in place was to delegate responsibilities. We set up scientists to always find the best naturalistic explanation no matter what. They are not even allowed to think about God while they have their lab coat on. Right. That's now, okay. now what look, the, look, here's the point okay. is, is uh, the, the reason this is important is because if you try to move from methodological naturalism to trying to say that, look, uh, or to, to come to any conclusions about truth finding there in that regard, um, you're doing something that, uh, what's the word, violates what the original intentions were. Well, first of all, I, I don't really care what the original intentions were. If their intention were not to trample on God's territory, you know, okay, that may have been how it started, but when you get into the modern era of science and you've got you know, Karl Popper and the ideas of falsification, now the justification for why we continue to lose these methodological naturalism is because it works and because no one is demo if somebody but, could demo sorry, sorry to interrupt, but doesn't it work on 99.99999% of theism? So here's the thing of this. So you have methodological naturalism. Here, I'm going to tailor this to you. You have methodological naturalism and methodological almost naturalism. They would both be just as successful. So you can't use the success of science to to. Well, wouldn't that be? Wouldn't that necessarily mean that adding the adding the theism or whatever is almost naturalism didn't actually add a damn thing to anything? No. If they're, if they're equally valuable, then basically you're saying that the theistic add-in doesn't add anything. Sorry, I don't understand. You're saying, I'm not granting Method that, I don't agree that everything has a natural explanation. Is that what you're suggesting that I'm saying? No, that? you said methodological naturalism and methodological almost naturalism would have the same success rate. No, because one of them is 99.9999. Oh, and the other one's 100. Oh, okay. I t I, you're talking about the success rate of like, so here's a question. So uh, not the best naturalistic explanation, for instance, of the origin of life may be the or RNA world. Do you consider that a success? Because I, I, have, no, I, don't, I have no idea. Okay, because you might say on naturalism that methodologically that's our best explanation. That's it, it, I mean, if you want to call that a success, you're right. I'm going to say no, that's not a success. So what I'm saying is that when we come, so science isn't about truth. Mm -hmm. It's not making declarations about truth. It's probabilistic in nature. It is telling us, Based on the available information, this is the best conclusion that we can reach. And these conclusions don't include appeals to anything other than nature. It's not declaring that the supernatural doesn't exist. The, the, the position of science is that, hey, we can't say anything about that until somebody provides a mechanism by which we can, if somebody could show a mechanism by which we could verify the supernatural, all of a sudden that would be within the realm of science. But that, pre so look, it's not truth seeking, you're right, because there are, in my opening statement, I made a case that you're going to have an explanation for the universe. And if you have an explanation, in the universe just is all the stuff that science works within, an explanation for the laws of nature. Okay, If you're going to have an explanation for the laws of nature, it can't be a scientific explanation. It can't be an explanation involving a mechanism. And yeah, you're right. Science is not a question. You're an explanation for the origin of the laws, not the actual... The explanation, like just the observation that these are the laws, this is how it works, because that that is science. Right, right, an explanation sure. for the origin of laws. Okay. Um, all right, so let, this is actually now, a question I, I wanted to get. So, I wouldn't go so far as to say science can't or can't ever, but it doesn't seem that it's possible to explain those things now. It, no, no, I disagree. It's logically impossible because scientific explanations are explanations in terms of initial conditions and laws acting on initial conditions. And so you can't use science to explain the fundamental laws of nature. To explain the origin of the laws of... The origin of the fun... I mean, if you yeah. call... Yeah, if you say the origin. I think there's confusion over one little word, but... Okay, right. and so this is actually a question I've wanted to ask you for a long time just in listening to the show. Because you grew up listening to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the... 
it's true. It's true. Um, so I, I've kind of detected what might be, uh, what possibly might be like a kind of a circle of protection that might prevent someone who uh, adopts sort of the strategies that you're taking to fend off supernatural explanations. Um, they might have put themselves in a situation where they can never find out if they're wrong or not. And I noticed a similarity between sort of all the sort of the things you say in order to um, in order to keep supernatural expl supernatural explanations out. They resemble very closely the way some biblical inerrantists uh, prevent um, allowing in the contradictions into their into their view. So if, if you try to you know show someone a contradiction, you might have even encountered theists who do this. And they'll I, say, I might even have been one. <laughs> and they'll, and you know, you try to show them a contradiction, and they'll say, "Look, this is just an argument from ignorance fallacy. You're just saying I don't know, therefore it's a contradiction." Um, or you're saying because we don't have a known explanation for this contradiction, then there is none. Or they'll say, "My standard of evidence is high." Yeah, right? except and, that I'm not saying. Or that's a lazy answer. I mean, I, I like it's if go one by one. And this is actually when I when I hear you sometimes now, I think to myself, "Wait a second, these are all the exact same things that a, a, someone who believes in biblical inerrancy." would say to protect their worldview. And, and I guess I wanted to know if you thought that was a problem. Well, I guess I'd have to add an example because the way you characterize it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's probably not wholly inaccurate, uh, but I'm not fending off supernatural explanations. I'm, currently, I have no reason, no mechanism to demonstrate that I can identify and verify a supernatural explanation. So when somebody offers up a claim that the supernatural is the cause of something and they offer no reason and no mechanism for me to independently verify that, of course I reject it. I would reject any claim along those lines, apart from the, the things that we just accept out of practical necessity, like so, the, so, that there's no solution to the problem part solved system or whatever. Yeah, and so I think some of this might come down But I'm to, not asserting that the supernatural isn't real. Right, and for the record... And also, for tomorrow, the record, you, today, mm -hmm. today, you or anybody else could demonstrate a mechanism. I'm not saying that it's impossible for you to demonstrate a mechanism of the supernatural, just that, to my knowledge, it hasn't happened. So this presupposes that a mechanism is required in order for it to be either possible or you're saying to rationally accept. To rationally accept. It, so this is where I was talking about the difference between what may or may not be true versus what it is reasonable to believe. And I don't think that it's reasonable to believe supernatural claims. So, uh, sorry to interrupt, there's, or we're yeah, short on time. It's just that, um, so this is a very unique way to approach the questions, is you're trying to take... Thank you. You're, I mean, so you're, you're taking, <laughs> you're taking um, methodological naturalism, and you're applying it to um, philosophy, right? No, I, actually, it's skepticism that I'm using. So the position, the position of philosophical skepticism is that the time to believe things is after they've been reasonably okay. established. Okay, I'm going to ask one last question. Sure. So what do you think about um, the electron when you keep talking about mechanisms um, where it seems like right now it's rather common to believe, to my understanding, to my understanding standard even, that there is no mechanism involved in what the electron does in terms of uh, its charge in repelling other electrons. There is no mechanism. I have no position on that at all. I have no expertise in that. In fact, if you think about it, your fundamental particles can't have deeper mechanisms. And so if you try to take this approach, it's going to destroy science. So what I would do in that case is I would get a hold of Sean Carroll, <laughs> who did this great talk at Skepticon 5 about known unknowns and unknown unknowns and how we know what we know about it. Because I don't know. I'm not a physicist. and by, by, I, don't, I don't even probably have a fundamental understanding of electrons to be able to assess the question. Do you so. see logically how there would have to be, though, your fundamental entities that would have their just fundamental abilities? You can't have an infinite regress of mechanisms. And so, so, so this, I don't think this is, I think if, if you approach questions this way, you're going to leave out true answers. So, sure. So, um, for example, string theory is kind of popular. If you said, do you believe string theory? I'd say, no. But that doesn't mean I believe it's wrong. I just don't have the relevant understanding of it to accept that it's true. And there's all kinds of things that I don't know. Tons of things I don't know. There's all sorts of things that I don't know that any of us know, no matter how much somebody really offers, I'm really convinced that string theory is right or this other one. To me, string theory looks like magic. But that's because I don't understand it, because I haven't bothered to study it, I think. Maybe if I studied it, I had a different view. Maybe I wouldn't, but I can't answer about that. As far as the infinite regress, um, 
when it, when it comes to you know particles and, and functions, uh, yeah, I, I see your point that there. I, I would I would say that there must be some smallest thing. Whether or not we're there, or understand it, is a whole other question. Yeah. And it, there wouldn't be a mechanism for what it just does. Not an external mechanism. It would be what it is. Yeah. Oh right, that's exactly right. Yeah. I was right. <laughs> Who said so? All right. We're gonna take a ten-minute break. We took a stage for Q and A. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.